Hi, everybody. John Haldy here, and I am really excited to have Joe Bowler and Andrew Martens of Assured Partners with me. Welcome, gentlemen. Nice to be here, John. Yeah, nice to be here. Thanks for having us, John. Joe and Andrew gave a presentation very recently in Dallas at the Line Hall Summit, and I was floored by the quality of the content. So I asked them if they would be willing, because some people in Dallas weren't able to actually be in their, in their session because there was multiple sessions at once, and some people couldn't make it to Dallas. I asked them if they'd be willing to come on and share all of this great content with us. So that's what we're doing today. So thank you, gentlemen. Yep, happy to do it. And um, yeah, we'll try and keep it... Uh... High, a little bit high level overview so everybody can, uh, you know, follow along easily. Uh, we understand it's like we mentioned when we we're at the show to everybody. It's not it's not everybody's you know funnest topic. So we, we try and keep it light, but informative at the same time. Right. But insurance is a massive part of risk management, and that's a big part of being a TSP. And what I loved about what you did was this wasn't an assured partners pitch. This was really an informative educational piece about understanding how the insurance works and how to acquire it, right? Yes, exactly. And uh, that's that's not what we're going to do today either. It's This is simply, you know, listen, obviously, we'd love to have everybody's business, but we know that's not realistic. Um, so, you know, we're, we're approaching this, hey, we, we just want people to be educated so that they understand it. Um, and then when they do go out to decide, hey, who do you want to work with or where do you want to go for your insurance? At least they've got a better roadmap, folks of how this actually works and, and what these things mean. So, Perfect. And we, I know you were a little time constrained in Dallas. So what we're doing is we're going to do three parts. Today, we're going to record the first part, which is all about auto insurance. Part two is going to be about workers' comp. And part three is going to be about how to shop for insurance. So if you're just tuning in to watch this, um, this is the first of, of three parts. And uh, I believe, gentlemen, that you are, have a PowerPoint deck that you had used in Dallas that we're going to use as a springboard for conversation, right? Yes. If yes. I could ask you to share that, that would be awesome. John, interrupt, you know, please, um, with any questions that you have, or um, if you think that there's, you know, something that comes to mind that uh, maybe we should ask this, uh, people will better understand we're, we're all ears here too. Um, again, this is not a, a sales pitch. We're just trying to get across to people, um, you know, how auto insurance actually works um, as a line haul contractor, right? It's it's a lot different than um, if you were just a regular over the over the road trucker um, and and you were not in contract with FedEx. There's there's some overlap and some similarities, but as everybody knows, the FedEx model is very unique. Um, and so is the insurance, right? Um, and so, yeah. So why don't we? Um, that who who pays for what? This actually, I believe, was was in Texas. Uh, this accident it was a couple of years ago. I, I think it was from uh, one of the ice storms. Is that right, Andrew? I'm not 100 percent sure where it came from, but this is a good depiction of all the different losses in any one any one given accident. You know, we got cargo all over the road there. We got the trailers, we got the actual truck that's destroyed, and then obviously the the other vehicle that was involved. And how are we going to figure this out? Right, like this is what we do. So you know, the way we approached it in in Texas at at the Line Hall Summit was, what are the biggest mistakes or misnomers that we come across when when we're introduced to a line haul contractor? Um, and, and to me, I, I still think that's the easiest way to explain this stuff. Uh, we meet contractors, and this is not a bash against any contractor, but you know, we meet contractors then that have been at this for over fifteen years. And, and come to find out they really didn't understand 100% how this works. And so we, we try to keep this as simple as possible. And, and really, the auto coverage as a line haul contractor is broken out into three kind of separate tiers, if you will. Okay. And so I think the easiest way to explain this is, is if you look at this first box here that says liability coverage. Okay. So when it comes to your auto insurance as a FedEx contractor, this box right here is FedEx, okay? FedEx is going to pay for anything that happens within this box, okay? And as a FedEx contractor, when you are out for delivery or out on a run, you are under FedEx authority. That's why 
As a line haul contractor, you don't have your own DOT number. You fall under FedEx's DOT, right? And so while you're out under authority for them, they are covering 100% of the liability, okay? And so when it comes to insurance and we say liability, well, what is liability? Liability is two things. It's anything or anyone else that you would hit, hurt, destroy, or damage. Okay, so liability, anyone, that could be another vehicle that you hit. It could be a pedestrian. Anything could be, hey, we, we took out a road sign. We smashed up a median. Uh, we damaged a dock backing into it. Okay, that's liability. Okay, and so when, when you're going down the road and you rear end somebody, that axe is going to pay for the damage to the vehicle um, that you were in. John, I just had an idea here. Um, this was hard to do at the at the summit because people couldn't see me at pools. If it's okay, I'm going to stop my screen share, actually. And let me grab my... So, John, you know, the easiest way to explain liability is over Zoom <laughs> is, is visually, okay? And okay. so... Um, I do this with all, all of our clients when we're going through the insurance, um, especially for the first time. And most people make fun of me and they usually reference uh, the movie Tommy Boy. Um, and so that's fine if everybody wants to be a comedian. But um, the, the before way. people ask, I'm not doing the fat man in a little jacket routine. Thank you. Uh, right. Yes. So um, this is a P&D truck, obviously. But, you know, for presentation purposes, if this is your line haul truck. Okay. The tractor. The tractor. Yep. So again, we're talking about liability, right? And, and how does it work as a FedEx contractor? So if if your truck is going down the road while you're under FedEx authority, okay, and you rear end somebody, let's let's call it Sally in her little red Saturn here. Okay. And you rear end Sally and there's damage to her car, but there's no damage to your truck. Okay. FedEx is going to pay to fix her car, right? Now FedEx charges you a deductible back because their insurance is paying to fix that, okay? But now let's say that, that you're going a little faster and you rear end Sally and there's damage to her car. She has injuries and there's also significant damage to your truck, okay? FedEx is gonna pay to fix Sally's car. FedEx is also gonna pay for all of her injuries, whatever it is, a sore neck, a broken neck, broken back, whatever it may be, and your insurance company, the contractor's insurance company is going to pay to fix their truck, okay? That, that, this is the biggest, that, that people don't understand this, um, and they think that their insurance is paying it because FedEx is charging them a deductible back. No, the deductible is really just FedEx's deductible for their insurance that they're charging you back, okay? And so a little color, if it's preventable, the deductible you get charged is really big, like 75 grand at the time of recording this. If it's not preventable, it's really just an accident that couldn't have been prevented. It's a much, much smaller number, like two, three grand, right? That's yeah, correct. Correct. Okay. okay. And, and you know, we seem to hear different things from contractors across the country. The most common that we hear is 75. I, I have heard different, and I don't know. Um I'd love clarity on that from FedEx, but we seem to hear a little bit different numbers on, on what those deductible amounts are. But Joe, uh, can you hold up the two cars and let me ask a quick question? Yes. Your imaginary P&D van has a set of doubles on the back. Yeah. Right. It's a tractor with doubles. And Correct. the trailers and the cargo get messed up. Who's paying for that? FedEx is. FedEx is. Okay. And then the last one, and I don't mean to, your driver is hurt. Mm -hmm. Who's paying for that? The contractor's workers' compensation is going to be primary and pay for that. And secondary would be FedEx? The situation was reversed and somebody somebody hit you and your driver got hurt. Okay. Your workers' compensation is going to be primary. And then your workers' compensation is going to go after the other party that hit you and try and recoup those dollars if they have insurance or enough insurance to, to pay for those damages to the employee or injuries to the employee. 
And if there was nobody else at fault that your driver caused the problem, does workers comp then go after FedEx for some money or is it all on you at this point? All on the work comp. Okay. Makes sense. Yep. Okay. So why don't I return to the share my screen again here? And I'm sorry for the dumb questions, but I think for new folks, I'm, yeah, I'm as no, dumb as questions. folks who just started. So yeah, no, they're they're great questions. And so, okay, so we've covered the liability portion. That's FedEx. Okay. Non-trucking liability is your liability coverage for when you are not under FedEx authority. Okay, which we understand as insurance agents, we understand that that's less than 2% of the time, okay? But but your contract requires you to have non-trucking liability. So if there is a situation where you are not under FedEx authority at the time, maybe you're just taking the tractor without a trailer and, and you're taking it down to, I don't know, Steve's Auto World, and they're going to do some mechanical work on it, okay? On your way to Steve's Auto World, you get in an accident. Well, you're not under FedEx authority. So in that situation, your insurance would be covering everything. Anybody else that you hit, a median, another person, another car, all of that, okay? This non-trucking liability insurance is extremely cheap. The average is like $31 a month per truck, okay? So, but it's required in your contract and you have to have this. And it's extremely cheap because they know that the percentage of miles you're running not under FedEx is minuscule compared to the amount you're doing otherwise, right? Exactly. Right. That's exactly right. Okay. Um, that's can exactly I, right. Can I take us down a little bit of a rabbit hole for a moment, a sidebar? Yeah. If you hear someone talking about getting their own DOT in order to use the truck for non-FedEx purposes... You can't just rely on NTL because you have to have an actual liability policy if you're going to use that truck at night for FedEx and during the day for some other purpose. Amazon, I'll say, right? Yep. You have to have your own DOT. You have to go through a whole lot of hoops, but then you need your own liability, trucking liability. You can't rely on non-trucking liability, right? That, that is correct. Okay. That is correct. So I'll, I'll give an example there. Um, you know, the average, and again, that, you know, people, please don't quote us on this pricing. It varies by your experience and your loss history and the age and size of the truck. But on average, you know, a, a line haul truck, you're going to pay, you know, a, a brand new line haul truck, you know, let's call it two grand a year per truck. Okay. Um, obviously, some are far less than that. Some are more than that. But let's just call it two grand a year per truck for your insurance as a FedEx contractor. If you were to go out on your own authority, on your own DOT, the average insurance per truck per year would be more realistically around six to $9,000 a year. Okay. And that's being very conservative on the low end. Um, we, we have some people under their own authority where, you know, a semi-tractor is thirteen to $15,000 a year per truck. Now. Is this just liability, NTL, physical damage, or all of them combined? Or liability and physical damage? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, as a line haul contract for FedEx, though, what you're paying for most of your insurance, auto insurance, comes from is the physical damage side. Okay. And, and the physical damage is simply, hey, that's the insurance to cover any damage to your tractor. And that's because. FedEx is covering the bulk of what would normally be it if you were hauling for someone else, the liability portion. Correct. Okay. Yep. yep. It, when, when, when you look at it this way, liability and physical damage, the, the liability is the most expensive part of the insurance. And as a FedEx contractor, you're not paying for that most expensive part. You are if you have a whole bunch of accidents and FedEx is charging you those deductibles back, right? Um, but again, not to sound like I'm, uh, I am not part of FedEx, but or siding with them. But you know, you don't even want to know uh, what the premiums are and and deductibles and reinsurance premiums that FedEx has to pay just to cover the liability. It's astronomical, um, astronomical. Okay, um, 
So I, I think I'm going to skip ahead one more page here because uh, this goes with physical damage. So again, physical damage is is really what most contractors, that's the largest part of your auto insurance when it comes to the premium of what you're actually paying for. Um, and this is another area where we see a lot of contractors misunderstand um, how this coverage works, okay? And physical damage, there's there's two options on how you can insure the physical damage. You can do it on actual cash value, or you can do it on stated value. Most contractors, uh, over 90%, are all on stated value, okay? And so let me just explain here, what is actual cash value? Actual cash value is the replacement cost less depreciation, right? So um, people are gonna laugh at, at these numbers examples, but again, I'm not a car salesman, I'm an insurance agent. Let's say you've got a, a 2015 Freightliner with, I don't know, 250,000 miles on it, okay? And you get into an accident and you total that truck out. Actual cash value would mean, okay, at the time of the loss, what was that 2015 Freightliner with 250,000 miles on it? What is the value of that at the time of loss? Okay. And that's what the insurance company is going to cut you a check for. Okay. So wait a minute. I got a question here. Yes. Because it says replacement costs less depreciation. So let's walk through something with a little more tangible meat on the bone. Yep. Two years ago, you bought a sleeper for 180 grand and it is depreciated according to the equivalent of Kelly Blue Book, 70 grand. So you have 110,000 of value left in that truck with the mileage that's on. Yep. And you total it. When you say replacement cost, do you mean a replacement cost for a new truck like it? No, replacement cost for the same truck that you lost. So in your example that you just gave, John, you okay. would get a check for $110,000. Okay. So, so you would get a check for about 110 grand. Do you have to fight with them? Because they say, well, according to our market, it's this, but you're like, but for me to actually buy it, it's 20 grand more. Like I can't find it for what you said. Yeah, that's a, that's another great question. And um, do you have to fight? Sometimes yes. Um, however, it, it should not be the contractor doing that. I, I recommend, hey, contact your broker if there's a disagreement there and let your broker be the one to contact the insurance company and say, hey, we've got a we've got an issue here or a discrepancy. Let's let's figure this out together. Um, your broker is always going to be able to get a lot farther down the road on that than you will be on your own. OK, uh, all insurance companies, I don't care which one you're with. the Everybody knows they want to pay as little as possible. OK, um, mm -hmm. not saying that they're uh, dishonest, but they're in a business to make money, too. And, and they don't want to pay any more than they have to. So it does happen sometime. And uh, we have insurance call us all the time. And, uh, hey, this is what they're saying. Here's what's going on. And we then hop on the phone with the carrier and help push it along and, and get it down the road to a more fair number, if at all possible. Um, sometimes, frankly, the insured is wrong too, you know, um, but, uh, you know, it, it goes both ways. Okay. They set up certain parameters as well when it comes down to like, Hey, where, what is the replacement cost on this vehicle? If we're going out there, usually they're using about a hundred mile radius. Hey, you know, within a hundred miles, what is a comparable vehicle costing you? And then they take that vehicle add the add-ins that you have and subtract the things that you don't have on that vehicle. And then they're trying to get a, a realistic picture of what the value of that vehicle is. Okay. Obviously, you know, things that, that often get overlooked are, hey, listen, we just put all brand new tires on this. Well, brand new tires are different than worn down tires and, and they're using their formulas to the best of their, their ability to. So those are all of the things that we tend to look at. Hey, we added uh, forward collision avoidance. We added, you know, the, the sonar cameras, we added this, that, and the other. And while they're going to give you some coverage back for those things that you added that weren't necessarily on this other vehicle as well. Okay. But I spent two grand to paint flames on the side of the cab, probably ain't coming back to me. 
No, but uh, oftentimes we see is, you know, if you, especially in FedEx world, right, you have to go and get your, your logos put on the side of the vehicles and, hey, listen, that that is a cost. There is a cost behind it. And so a lot of times what they'll do is they'll, they'll file that as part of the claim. And typically they won't give you that money back until you do actually do the replacement of of putting your name on the side of the car or adding the FedEx logo or whatever it happens to be that you do on the side of your vehicle. Okay. So car wraps do provide some value. Um, it depends on which carrier you're talking to. Some people th say that it's a, it's not a depreciable asset. It actually decreases the value of the vehicle to have your logo on it. However, we typically fight that one, obviously, because there is value to the, to the contractor in those situations. So you said 80 to 90% of contractors tend to be in the stated value bucket. What's that? Yeah. So, so stated value, and this is where we see most people get confused on actual cash value versus stated value. So stated value is actual cash value. Okay. So it, everything that we just talked about is going to work the same way with stated value. However, the insurance company is just never going to pay you more than the stated amount that you gave on when we when we wrote the insurance policy. Okay, so so let me let me explain. So you're with insurance company A, and and you come to us or another broker, and they put you with insurance company B. Well, that new insurance carrier is going to say, hey. You know, when we're when we're rating this up, you know, we do it on stated value. So we need we need to see what what are the current stated values of your vehicles. It, and a stated value is something that the contractor is going to decide. So, John, you might have, um, you know, 10 brand new vehicles that, that you just bought and you're going to put the stated value on those because they're brand new and they don't have any miles at one hundred and eighty eighty thousand dollars. OK, a piece. But you might also have, you know, some older vehicles and they have a ton of miles on them and they're worn down. And, and you as a contractor know that, hey, the, the real market value for this truck as of today is actually probably only one hundred and ten thousand dollars or eighty thousand dollars, what whatever the number might be. OK, and so your insurance, you're going to pay more more. For the vehicles that are valued higher on the stated value, you know, you're going to pay more premium on a $180,000 vehicle for, for physical damage than you would on a vehicle that has physical damage coverage of only $80,000. Okay. So what stated value is really is it's really just a way for a contractor to control their insurance costs. Right. You, you, if, if you have a fleet of vehicles, yes, yeah, some are new, but a whole bunch are older. Well, you don't want to pay physical damage coverage with them all rated at one hundred and eighty thousand because that's not the value of, of the entire fleet anymore. OK, so stated value, you get into an accident and you total that truck out. The insurance company is still only going to give you whatever the vehicle was worth at the time of the loss. So, so let's say the vehicle that got totaled, you, you had a stated value of 110000 okay? That, that's the value that you gave the insurance company, okay, when you wrote the policy. And maybe six or seven months have gone by, and now you get into an accident and you total that truck out. Well, you've put more miles on the vehicle, right? It's depreciated a little bit. So at the time of loss, potentially... Maybe it's only worth $100,000, not $110,000. You're only getting a check for $100,000. What stated value is, is it, it's a cap. So the insurance companies, if at the time of loss, the insurance company says, well, the vehicle's worth $130,000. You know what? Too bad. You gave a stated value of $110,000. The most you're going to get is $110,000. Okay? So, so it's a way, and I can see you've got questions, but this might answer it. It, John, is it's a way also to control your insurance premium costs. Some contractors might be willing to, to take on a little bit more risk of certain vehicles. So they might lower that physical damage a little bit within reason um, to, to help with the insurance premiums. Let, let's see if I understand this. Yep. 
the premium is calculated on stated value. At the time of a total loss, they're only going to pay you the lower of stated value or actual cash value. Whichever one of those two is lower, that's what they'll pay you. Correct. So is this why I've heard insurance folks say, as a matter of good hygiene, you should regularly be updating your stated value with your insurer on some frequency. And I've heard some people say annual, I've heard quarterly, I've even heard some people say monthly if it's allowed. But as the value of your trucks decline, based on actual cash value, if you don't lower your stated value, you're paying premium that you'll never recruit because if you don't do it and you started at 180 the day you bought the truck and two years later it's worth 110, the insurance company will happily let you pay premium as though it's 180, but if you total the truck, they're only giving you 110. Exactly. Exactly. And and the biggest mistake that we see is a lot of contractors don't understand that stated value is actual cash value. And so I come across contractors all the time and 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 not because they're stupid, not because they don't pay attention. It's just it's it's confusing, right? Is a lot of contractors have the impression that, well, no, if I get into an accident and total that out, I'm going to get the stated value that I gave. Well, no, you're going to get the lowest amount. You're just never going to get more than the stated value. So absolutely. And we ask contractors all the time, you know, every year. Uh, as as you come up for renewal, we're saying, hey, we need updated stated values. Are you sure that these are still accurate? And it's not always, John, just lowering the value. Maybe he's done something to drastically improve improve the value of that vehicle. It's got a um, brand new engine in it or um, all new tires and a new transmission, um, you know, is where, hey, you know what, maybe we're going to bump this up. Where we really saw people get in trouble was um, over COVID and the the used market went way up and we would have insureds that were drastically actually underinsured on vehicles, right? Okay. Um, because of the stated value. So it works both ways. It's less common to need to increase it, but there are situations where that happens. It's most common that we need to lower uh, the amount based on the depreciation of the vehicle. So you almost want to ratchet it down to the ACV so you're not overpaying. Correct. Now, just to make sure, I, I heard something once. If I'm a contractor and all my trucks have an ACV of 110, let's just bought them all at the same time. Yep. And now, now they're at 110. But I'm rolling in cash. And I remember what my mom and dad taught me, which is insurance is there to cover the things you can't afford to pay. Right. Mm -hmm. And I say, man, I've got an extra 150 grand in the bank for a rainy day fund. I'm going to save a little money and take my stated value from 110 to 95 because I could afford to take a 15 grand hit if I had a complete loss. Absolutely. Is that a cost management function that I'm allowed to do? Yes, absolutely. Now there's variables with that, John. If 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 your auto fleet is let's say six vehicles. Well, listen, taking six vehicles valued at 110,000 down to 95,000 probably isn't going to save you much in the terms of premium savings okay. where it might make sense for you to take on that risk. Um, instead, I would look at maybe raising your deductible um, a little bit higher instead. Um, now, now, it could be you've got a fleet, hey, you've got 20 or more vehicles. Well, yeah, if you have 20 vehicles at 110,000 and you take all those 20 and go down to 95, that, that's enough vehicles where, it's, where it might make enough of a premium savings where that might make sense for you to take on that risk. So again, every contractor should talk to their broker and ask them that. Um, but, but it's going to vary, you know, kind of based on, you know, your radius of operations and where you are and number of vehicles is going to affect that as well. Okay. But that's something to work on with your broker, play yep. what if and figure out what works for you. Yep. yep. Okay. So the only it. other thing, and it came up at the line hall summit while we were there is, you know, I, I bought these trucks through Ryder as an example. Now Ryder is also going to give you, Hey, listen, if, if you destroy this truck, this is the value that we need to 
insure them for because these are your loan amounts and we got to make sure that we're made whole again. And so sometimes there's caveats where, hey, listen, we can't reduce your amount because Ryder is requiring you to carry certain thresholds of coverage. Um, but yes, uh, exactly what Joe said. I mean, we, where we see greater cost savings is usually on the deductible side. Um, I mean, and and in all reality, if you have a really old, a really old fleet and you say, hey, listen, if this truck breaks down, I'll use it for parts. FedEx is only requiring you to carry the NTL. You essentially don't have to cover the physical damage portion of your vehicle if you choose so. But that's for newer contractors, if they're watching, that's probably not, self-insuring is not a place you're going to go unless you're a trust fund baby, right? Correct. Probably not. Um, there's extenuating circumstances. I mean, you know. Right. Uh, okay. Okay. So deductible, though, is is the, is the another area where we see um, a, a lot of mistakes. And, and frankly, John, I, I don't know why but it seems like every single line haul contractor we come across that that we don't handle their insurance on but we look at the policy overwhelmingly almost all of them have a deductible of a thousand dollars okay and in this day and age i'll just tell you my my personal vehicle which is nothing spectacular <laughs> okay i have a fifteen hundred dollar deductible on my personal vehicle um and, you know, we're talking about trucks that majority of them are valued over $100,000. You know, if you really want to save some money, you know, we advise our contractors, go, let's look at a $2,000, let us look at a $2,500 deductible, sometimes, sometimes higher. Um, and what I challenge contractors on, as I, I, I say it this way, is look. If you get into an accident and there's damage to your truck, and let's say the damage is five thousand dollars to repair it, are you going to turn that claim in? You know, or or if it's a three thousand dollar damage, are, are you going to turn that claim in, or are you, are you, are you just going to fix it? Right. Uh, most contractors that we talk to say, "Yeah, we're just going to fix that." Well, okay, and I agree with that. But then why do we have a thousand dollar deductible, right? Why, why are we paying more for our insurance on a thousand dollar deductible? Where a higher deductible can get contractors in trouble is if, hey, if you're a contractor that you've just been having some bad luck or for whatever reason, based on your territory or geographical area that you operate in, you have a lot of auto claims. Well, then, yes, going from a thousand to a $2,500 deductible, you know, potentially could eat into those premium savings. But if you only have one or two claims a year on your auto insurance, you, you, you contractors should really look at raising that deductible up higher. Is it the case that loan covenants, if you finance the truck or lease terms, if you're leasing, specify the deductible or is that usually left up to the operator? Usually left up to the operator as a as a line haul contractor. Okay. They might take issue with a fifty thousand dollar deductible. They might want to see some collateral or a line of credit or something. But I've we've never come across that on a. And, and going back to where you talked about loan covenants for the stated value, if there's a situation where the loan covenant is wildly higher than the ACV, can you argue that with the lender typically? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of times you'll see there will be arguments to be had on that. And in most instances, they're they're usually pretty reasonable on coming back. Um, some of the things that we can do behind the scenes, too, is, hey, listen, we we've gone out and we've seen that this vehicle like you want it to be insured for one hundred ninety five. Well, we're seeing this vehicle in the open marketplace be one hundred and seventy or 180,000, not 195. And, and so what we'll do is we'll do some research for them as well and say, hey, look, not only are we insuring it for 180, but in most with most insurance companies nowadays, we're seeing that there is um, so-called fluff coverage 
um, but it gives you gap coverage. So what the loan amount is versus the value of the vehicle at the time of loss, they'll give you some gap coverage, which is that additional 10, 15, $20,000 gotcha. on that vehicle. Okay. Makes sense. Thank you. Uh, speaking of gap coverage, it's probably a good thing um, to, to talk about. Um, most, in, most insurers that will write a FedEx contractor, um, the gap coverage is usually capped out at 15000 Okay. So, yeah, if you owe 115000 on the truck and at the time of loss, it's only worth 100000 the insurance policy comes with gap coverage to fill in that $15,000 gap, okay? Um, usually that's plenty, but contractors do need to be aware. Um, most of the time, it's never an issue. Where we saw an issue is, unfortunately, because contractors didn't have a choice, you know, in 2020 and 2021, when they had to go out and buy vehicles, they paid a lot of money for those vehicles. And today, you know, the values have come down is now we're seeing more than we ever have before where vehicles are totaled out and they do owe a lot more than it's worth. So we have seen recently more gap coverage claims. Um, so it's, it's just something that, yeah, contractors need to be aware of, um, of when they bought the vehicle and the value on it compared to today's market. So this is a case where there's a total loss. They stroke a check, say for 140, but your loan amount that you have to make good on is 160 yeah. instead of 140. So the, it's an option within your existing, or you have to get a separate gap policy. Well, it depends. It depends. All the carriers we work with, it's going to come with. It's you know, gap coverage is going to you know come come with that up to 15,000, and that's pretty standard. Um, so in your example there, John, well, that they owe 20 grand more than more than it's worth, right, to the lender. So if they have $15,000 gap coverage, well, it'll cover 15, but then the contract is responsible for that additional size to pay the lender and make it good. Okay. Now we jumped ahead in your presentation because you wanted to explain this to me. Yep. Non-trucking liability, the the just kind of talking about the limits and and some of how these coverages work. And, um, and this is the part where, like, my manager's taking the truck from the yard to the shop, that kind of thing, non-trucking, right? Yep, non-trucking liability, yeah. Or, or, or I've decided to move the truck from one terminal to another because there's an opportunity to get a load over there, but I'm not being dispatched by FedEx. I'm choosing a bobtail. Correct. Okay. So your requirement with FedEx, the only, and this is what's amazing about FedEx, is as a contractor, you are only required to have a million dollar non-trucking liability limit, which was really this day and age. I mean, that's crazy. Any other trucking contractors that we work with outside of FedEx is they're gonna have a million, plus they're gonna have a 2 million or up to a $5 million umbrella on top of that. So this is all that FedEx is requiring you to have. As a contractor, you can go up to, you know, your non-trucking liability limit could go up to 2 million if you choose to, to pay for that. Um, and we, we do have some situations with contractors where they say, I wanna buy an umbrella policy on top of that too. So maybe this is another good opportunity. Let me stop my share. And you can see me again, we'll go back to the Tommy boy thing and everybody can make fun of me, but non-trucking liabilities, so you have a million dollars, right? You have a million dollars of coverage. And you're in this example here, you are not under FedEx authority, okay? And you're going down the road and something happens and you veer and you come into the other lane and you do a head-on collision with somebody, okay? And there's a family in the car and the spouse is hurt, the husband's hurt, and the child is deceased because of this accident. Well, your non-trucking liability policy has what? It has a million dollars and that's it. So yes, less than 2% of the time as a FedEx contractor, you are not under FedEx authority, but they do need to understand the risk, right? Is, hey, when you're not under FedEx authority and you're driving these missiles down the road, you've only got a million dollars of coverage typically. 
So it is something that, you know, we talk to contractors about, and it's up to them whether they want to purchase, you know, additional coverage on top of that. Um, but as everybody knows, John, this day and age, a million dollars isn't much, and it doesn't take much to eat through that. When you talk about umbrella on top of that, is it umbrella NTL or is it just corporate umbrella? Uh, a bit of a loaded question, but uh, an umbrella policy is a whole separate bucket of money just sitting there. And that bucket of money, typically on an umbrella policy, sits on top of your auto liability, your employer's liability, and your general liability if you have it. It sits okay. on top of all three insurance coverages, right? So if you had a million dollar umbrella, John, and you got in this accident, and well, the million dollars on your NTL was used up. Now you have another million dollars sitting here waiting to go on top and, and pay that claim. Does that make sense to you? It does. Okay. It does. Okay. So again, you know, um, if you allow me to be an insurance nerd for a moment, and what do we do is, is we insure risk, right? And in the insurance world, when your risk is small and something does happen, it's, it's usually not a small claim. It's usually pretty bad. Um, it's, it's just what we see. So, um, but it is something like, hey, is it required to have more than a million? No, um, but it's something every contractor should at least understand and know, right? And, and it might make them make different judgment when they're not under facts authority is, do we really want to take this truck at this time of day in this traffic down to Steve's Auto World? Or do we want to wait until later in the day where there's less traffic or those things? Because if you get into an accident at that point, you've only got a million dollars sitting there. And, and my understanding, and maybe this is wrong, but when you've got a million dollar liability and it's supposed to cover a potentially catastrophic accident, you know, if, if your NTL kicks in because you had a fender bender and nobody got hurt and their attorney is coming after you for, oh, my client's back hurts a little bit. I want 50 grand in pain and suffering your NTL insurer is going to assign a lawyer and they're going to fight that probably. Correct. You have a catastrophic and there's two people dead. They're not even going to assign a lawyer. They're going to stroke a million dollar check and then they're going to tell you you're on your own. Correct. Because that's the cap on, on your policy. It's not even worth fighting it at that point because they know it's done. They're not even going to give you a lawyer to help argue it. It's you're on your own. You're on your own after that. Your law. Yep. So again, we're not trying to listen, we get it, right? Is you know, 98% of the time, maybe even higher your under facts authority, but it's something that, you know, a lot of contractors, again, we're, we're talking about education here. That's something that we see that they didn't they didn't really understand. Right. That's what we're talking about. And look, you're never gonna button it up so safe and tight. You're not gonna child proof your business, right? No. Nope. It's about risk management and finding the right balance of what can you tolerate, what can't you tolerate. And, and I like what you were saying. Look carefully at the deductibles because you can tolerate eating an extra thousand every now and then. It's the multi-million dollar policy thing, blind spot that could end your business tomorrow. Correct. And um, yeah, so some of the, exactly. So some of the other coverages, you know, that are you know, on all FedEx contractors policy is it's always abbreviated UM slash UIM. So uninsured slash underinsured motorist coverage. Okay. And what, what this is, is if somebody else hits you, okay. And the damage to your truck was 80 grand. Okay. Well, the person that hit you, they just had the basic limits. They don't, they've only got 25,000. So your, your policy comes with underinsured coverage. That's to cover the difference in the dollar amount that others party didn't have to cover to repair your vehicle. Let me, let me say it again. If somebody else hits you and they damage your truck severely and the, the damage to your truck to repair it is, let's say, $80,000, well, their policy might only have limits up to $40,000. So they're, they're $40,000 short. So on your insurance policy, you have underinsured motorist coverage to cover that gap. And, and this is the part of the policy that will pay for that difference. It's coming out of your policy. Uninsured motorist coverage would be, hey, somebody hit you, there's $80,000 damage to your truck, and guess what? 
the party that hit you, they didn't have any insurance, okay? So uninsured, underinsured motorist coverage is to protect you against people that don't have enough insurance or don't have any insurance at all, which there is a lot of. It's rampant out on the roads, okay? Personal injury protection. Andrew, you want to run with this one? Yeah, so this is going to cover the the resulting injuries that you have from somebody else hitting you pays things like your wages, your lost wages, different things along those lines. Ultimately, first and foremost is work comp if you're if you're working at the time. However, if you're not working at the time, this is going to provide you with coverage while, while you can't get back to work and um, any medical medical loss. Again, if you if you're hit by somebody, they're like, no, we're not paying your medical bills. Well, this is going to or it's you, you've capped out all your liability, all the liabilities on the other policy to cover you for those situations. So dumb question. Yep. Yep. I'm an operator. I'm in Georgia. It's not on this list. Right. But my trucks go back and forth to Orlando and they are on this list as required. Do I as a TSP have to have this because they touch Florida? Or is it based on domicile only? Yeah, it's domiciled wherever your vehicles are domiciled um, is going to govern what you have to have. And would you tell someone in that scenario where it's not required that you should get it anyway? Again, it's it's about managing where you want your dollar spent and what risks that you feel are necessary to be covered. Um, you can buy, up, buy standalone PIP policies and excuse my... Um, acronyms. I'm just used to talking in that language, but the personal injury protection is something that you can purchase on the side. Um, it's very minimal cost, and it just depends. Hey, is this going to help me put my head on the pillow at night? Okay. Um, again, a lot of, I, I'm sorry. I don't. I don't mean to interrupt you there, Joel. But a lot of high valued individuals, like if it's an owner that's taking these vehicles for whatever reason, let's say he wants to take one of his semis home at night. He's not working. There's an opportunity, or let's say he's moving it from Georgia to Florida or Minnesota to Florida over a weekend. And he's like, I'm driving that truck, high valued individual behind the wheel. Want to make sure that my wages are covered if I if I do get hit by somebody. Okay. I think, I think one of the easiest ways to look at this is going off of what Andrew just said is contractors don't need to get too worked up about, about the PIP. Anytime an employee is in the truck and they get hurt, workers' compensation is always going to be primary. Your workers' compensation policy is always going to be the primary one that, that's going to pay for that. Is As Andrew said, yeah, if you're an owner and you're taking that truck, you know that's where you, you'd want to consider and, and we recommend that you have that coverage. And I I think I would leave it at that. Okay. So if I'm an owner without a CDL, I probably don't need PIP. No. (laughs) (laughs) Let's work on getting your CDL (laughs) before you jump in that truck. Yeah. Um, Okay. So why don't we go? um, So, so, you know, we've covered the physical damage. And and again, this is the biggest portion as a contractor, what their paying premiums on. Okay. And we've gone through that. Um, Andrew, do you want to run through kind of what, you know, f- factors that our underwriters are looking for um, that, that can determine pricing on your account as well? Yeah. So a lot of this stuff is is basically when an underwriter gets a gets a, pa- or a piece in, they're seeing thousands of applications a day or a month or whatever you want to say, but depending on who they are. But um, they all have check boxes that they have to go through. And these are the, the most common things that are found on those check boxes between insurance companies. They're, they're gonna wanna see like, you know, where it's at, what vehicle, what's the radius, the weight of the vehicle, do they have telematics, do they have a fleet maintenance schedule, do they have all of these things that you see here? How do they have them? Or first of all, do they have them? How advanced are they? And they all provide additional credits when it comes down to underwriting the risk. So sometimes you see it where, hey, listen, there's a company that has a really high loss ratio when it comes to to their business. 
but they've done this, 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 and this since that accident. So the thought of the risk being at the level that it was when they had the accident and where is it at right now? And so a lot of these things come into play when you're looking at the overall risk. Um, they just want to make sure that, I mean, you're, you're always mandated by FedEx to have most of these things already. Have you told your broker about it? Hey, we added this additional service that we're doing. Hey, we have GPS. Hey, we have um, forward collision avoidance. We added sonar. We added all sorts of different things, even outside of FedEx, that we feel that that will help us long term. Hey, we got electronic logs, right? We got an ele electronic log book. We have a electronic fleet maintenance. We 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 go went out and got the app that everybody's able to do it. So they're all time stamped. Hey, we we did a vehicle check at this time. This is the individual that did it. Um, so that ultimately they're they're trying to prevent the most possibility of a loss. How much does checking the boxes affect premiums? Um, surprisingly, outside of a very few carriers, it is going to make a, a factor. And and if you're a, if on paper you're a, a tough loss or you're a tough risk. These are all things that are going to help sway the underwriters. Yeah, we will actually look at this because they've been proactive in terms of, hey, listen, we understand that you you didn't understand the full spectrum of, of your risk at, at one point, and you've done proactive measures to make sure that things like this don't happen again. And it can sway an underwriter's decision to say, hey, yeah, we will rate this as if it was a good risk. Or if, if they're not doing some of these things, hey, this is a bad risk. We, we don't even want to insure this company. We don't want to take, take a chance because for in their eyes, it's, it's if or it's when, not if. If I'm a contractor with 20, 12 trucks and I go to an insurance broker to talk about, and this is for, for liability, NTL or FISDAM or both. All, it's all. All of it, yeah. That Should we talked about. Should I expect my broker, my agent, to be walking through this with me with all the trucks and having me fill this stuff out to get the best underwriting? In our in our side of it, we always say, hey, listen, you know, obviously with, with FedEx, you're required to have certain things. And so we know that behind the scenes, just because we've viewed enough contracts to understand, hey, th these are all the pieces that do. But we always talk to them, hey, do you have any additional things that you guys are doing? Do you have the digital maintenance logs? Do you have, do you do additional driver hiring? Obviously, first advantage is required. But do you do anything else besides that? Is it you, is it a situation? You do your own safety trainings outside of what's required with FedEx, those kind of yeah. things. John, if John, if you came to us, okay, and said, Hey, I want you to quote my auto insurance. And in, in order to get a quote for your auto insurance, we have to see your history, right? What what do your losses look like over the last preferably three plus years? Okay. Um, and we get your losses. And well, John, you haven't had any losses. Uh, phenomenal, right? You're you're you haven't had any accidents at all. An insurance company is still going to look at these boxes, but they're not going to look at these boxes as closely. Okay. Yeah. Conversely, conversely, you come to us and you we get your loss runs, and well, holy cow, you know your insurance premiums on your auto are fifty thousand dollars a year, but you're averaging. $75,000 a year in claims, right? So then an insurance company, when we're negotiating and getting them to accept your risk at a good price, they're going to look at all these boxes very heavily um, and frankly, boxes outside of that. And, and that's where contractors need to talk to their broker and their broker should be running through these things with them, right? Because that's going to help you get the best price. And in some situations, it's not about who's the lowest price, Who's actually going to write this insurance because our losses have been so terrible? Well, by answering these questions and working with your broker and your broker being the one that they're wrapping this up in a nice, pretty bow and presenting it to the insurance company is going to help greatly um, in, in getting, number one, a quote, and then hopefully, number two, a very competitive quote back. Got it. 
Okay. So, a lot of sense. yeah, like Andrew said, most of these, hey, you know, you're required by FedEx and, and most of the insurance carriers that are out there that, that would even start writing a FedEx contract in the first place know that as well. Um, some don't, but some of them do ask, hey, outside of that, are they doing, you know, um, vehicle accident um, reports? You know, what, what do they do after an accident? Is there, you know, what are the ramifications of it? Um, another big one that people overlook is a reward program. Do you as a contractor have a reward program where if your employee goes accident free for so many months or years, they get um, bonuses or things like that? That's a great thing for us to be able to tell and talk to our insurance carriers about that you do. They get excited about that kind of stuff. It shows that you're on the forefront of wanting to have a safe community, a safe environment, and you're heavily focused on on keeping the driver safe. It helps us get the best pricing back. Gotcha. Okay. No, it makes sense. And, and I think a lot of contractors do a lot of this stuff. I don't know if they take the time to document it with their insurance brokers. I, I've never bought insurance, never looked over one of TSP's shoulders, but um, I would hope that they're getting credit for these things. Mm -hmm. So do we. So do we. So talk to your broker. And, and obviously, radius of operations, state analysis, that you have less control over. If you got a wild team, you got a wild team. If you got solos doing spot work locally, that's a different story, right? And I mean that plays into it too, right? If you're if you're driving through the mountains of Colorado, they're they're gonna take take account on on those situations. If you're if you're in Florida, obviously, if you're domiciled in Florida, we all know like there was nine companies last year that went insolvent in Florida because of property losses, flooding, you know. I shouldn't really say flooding, but water damage and different things along those lines. So, so just knowing all those things, all those factors do come into play when when underwriters are looking at risks, and you just want to make sure that you're you're well aware. Hey, do I have a preventative plan? If there's an imminent hurricane bearing down on the Florida coastline, do I have a plan that I'm going to move my vehicles inland, or am I going to move them north north? so that the potential for a catastrophic loss is minimized. Ultimately, they don't wanna lose their trucks any more than, than the insurance company does, right? Because if their wheels aren't moving, they're not making money. So do you have a plan in place in those situations? California wildfires, same idea. Here's a question, I know we're running a little past our expected time, but I gotta ask this. Do underwriters of FedEx TSPs care about whether the runs are assigned or unassigned yes. yeah i mean I if you're not. yes so if if you think about it right if you're doing the same route over and over again you know all the pitfalls you know where the construction zones are you know hey listen i got to be in the left lane going under this overpass so that i'm not ripping off the top of my truck all of those things play into account so if you're just doing wild runs and you're one day i'm in going from Florida to Texas, one day I'm going from Florida to North Carolina or New York. Obviously they, they wanna know where you're going and how you're doing it. And if it's wild, they're like, well, what, what experience do you have well, in wild uh, runs? I've heard anecdotally too, that if you have an assigned run that leaves at 10 p.m. every night and your driver sleeps till eight, gets up, has breakfast, goes to work, that's a very different thing that sleep consistency is highly correlated to safety and that if some days they have to get up at eight but then they don't actually leave till 5 a.m and now they're turning on the clock but that now they're working when they would normally be going to sleep i was curious if underwriters are looking that granularly at it that an unassigned run you're going to pay more in premium not necessarily more in premium for an unassigned run but they're going to ask more questions about that contractor when they're considering the pricing Again, we're talking we're, we're talking here, John, about what are the underwriters doing? We're not saying, because frankly, and I've talked to other contractors about this, well, you know what? When I have an uh, ex-employee and he does the same run every day all week, well, yeah, the driver actually, because he's on the same run all day every week, could get complacent. He gets too comfortable with that, and, and that in itself could be dangerous. I, we agree with that. But- we're talking about what the underwriters are looking for, and the underwriters are more comfortable with somebody doing the same familiar run every day 
irregardless of that fact. Okay. Um, just just what the underwriters are looking for. And that's what we have to appease to, to get contractors the best price going forward. Got it. Thank you. Um, premium calculation, uh, pretty simple. Uh, again, it, you know, these, John, these are just averages. Um, but, you know, the non-trucking liability, as we discussed, you know, it, it's, it's dirt cheap. You know, average contractor is going to pay about 31 bucks a month per truck for non-trucking liability. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, you, you bump up from a million to two million, you know, it could be around 55 bucks a month per truck. Okay. And then the physical damage, um, average truck with a hundred thousand dollar value and a thousand dollar deductible. And again, why are we putting a thousand dollar deductible? Because that's what we most commonly see. Uh, we don't always agree with that. We think most contracts should have a higher deductible than that. You know, they're going to average between 223 and 557 a month. For a hundred thousand dollars, that's a thousand We're going to do a whole nother separate thing on how to shop. So correct, right? Um, I'm not going to hit you with questions about that right now. Thank you, though. Yeah. So, but I, I think you know, unless there's something, uh, John, that you think um, is weighing on your mind that maybe we didn't answer here, that those are kind of the big um, basics of the auto insurance. So no, I I think you guys have broken it out really simply so that even I can get it. Primary liability, when you're operating, hauling trailers for FedEx, that's FedEx's thing, right? The liability. Yep. NTL is for when you're moving the truck around, not moving FedEx's freight. Correct. And FISDAM, physical damage, I've heard it called FISDAM. Is that the right lingo? Yeah, yeah. That's an abbreviation. Yep. Physical damage is covering the vehicle itself because FedEx doesn't cover that. They cover their trailers, the cargo, and things you hit and people you hit, but not your tractor. Correct. Okay. That makes sense to me. Um, okay. And hopefully people kind of understand now the coverages are, I think, self-explanatory what we've gone through. And hopefully people you know, kind of understand some of the nuances of how some of these things actually can affect your premiums. Right. And that's, I guess, the message that we wanted to get across. And just to make sure I'm clear, when your driver is in the yard looking for his trailer to pick up, are they operating under FedEx's authority at that moment? Yes. So most of these so called yard incidents would be under FedEx's liability, but your physical damage would still co come into play if you hit a switcher or a pole or you banged into a trailer or something like that. Now I can, John, I can hear contractors, you know, arguing that it should be under FedEx authority. If it's not, you know, you need to you don't swear at your terminal manager, but you need to take that up the level. You know, FedEx doesn't want to pay anything, um, you know, on, on that stuff, but yeah. Well, and, and they're probably going to rubber stamp the first pass as preventable. So it's all going to flow downhill to you anyway. So you have a new new can of worms to deal with. But but in theory, what I was saying makes sense, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, this is great, guys. This is, I mean, phenomenal. I've been around this space for years now, and it's always been gobbledygook. Now I have it crystal clear, like well enough that I think I could explain this to someone else. This is This is awesome. Good. Well, we're always looking for good people, John. You want to come over here and be an insurance <laughs> I don't have the brain power to do what y'all do, but thank you. I'm flattered. Um, this was part one, right, gentlemen? Yes. Part two, where the hero gets into, in, in, in act two, the hero gets into trouble with and, and finds his character and whatnot, according to the famous stories, storylines, is workers' comp, right? Yep. Um, so we will put that out very closely after this. We'll schedule some time to do that. Um, we're going to add to the video here your contact information. Is it fair to say that if people want to call you to learn more about this, you're open to that, that it's not a sales thing, that you're happy to educate folks? Absolutely. Anytime. Yeah, I'll um, tell you right now. If <laughs> Listen, if you love your broker, but you still want to call us for questions, stay with your broker and give us a call. We'll unbiasedly answer and tell you anything you want to know about insurance. Thank you for that. That's a huge offer. I, I realize that that's not the norm. Um, so you guys are wonderful. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks everybody for, for tuning in. 
and we're going to uh, very soon record up the workers' comp piece and then part three, how to shop for this stuff and do it intelligently. Sounds good. Jack, 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 work comp. Everybody's favorite topic, work comp. <laughs> the necessary evil, right? Yeah. Right. So thank, thanks a lot, John. And uh, yeah, people, please call us, call us, email us with questions. I don't know where you'll put the contact information, but I'm sure it'll be there somewhere. Yep. Reach out and happy to, we just want to help any way we can. So thank you, gentlemen. Y'all have a good day. Thanks, thanks John. John.